Well, this afternoon, I want to continue this series that I've been calling The Beauties of Christ. I want to continue with looking at Jesus Christ as our example. So again, this morning, like the last time we opened the Word, we will not have necessarily one text we'll be examining, but we'll be walking through several different texts. And I want to, God willing, spend this week, as well as next week, looking at the example of Christ. Perhaps we may even spend more than two weeks. We could spend any number of weeks looking at the example of Christ. He set an example for us in a multitude of ways in his incarnation. But I want to examine the, the example Jesus Christ has set for Christian living today. After all, it is one of the reasons for his incarnation. We looked the last time that Jesus is the God-man. He became flesh. And why did he become flesh? Well, we looked at he became flesh to be our representative, our representative in perfect law keeping, keeping the law that we could never keep. And then not only that, but he became our representative in paying the price for sins. That's why Christ became man. But he also became man so that he could set an example for man. But notice something. The beauty of Christ is that he is our example for Christian living. Notice that? Christian living. Not just living. How many times have we heard that Jesus Christ was a good teacher who had some good sayings and he's a good model to follow? Just for everyone can adopt some of the teachings of Christ or look at his behavior and say, okay, I'll imitate Christ here or there. Jesus Christ did not come to be an example simply for men to live by. He became an example for Christians to follow. Jesus Christ is only our example after he becomes our Savior. Michael preached in Sunday school recently from Ephesians chapter 5, and he said very strikingly that we ought not to try to act like a Christian before becoming a Christian. Jesus does not call you to a life of imitation before he calls you to a life of following, a life of picking up your cross and following after him. Michael used the illustration of a father. Before you imitate a father, he's got to be your father. A little boy imitates his father. He doesn't imitate other children's fathers. He imitates his father. Why? Because it's his father. Daddy, it's his father. So it is with Christ. Before we look to Christ to imitate him, we ought to look to him as our savior and follow after him. Before Jesus Christ called his disciples to imitation, what are the two words that he would say to them as he walked along the path? Follow me. And as they followed him, then they began to imitate him. And so Jesus Christ came to demonstrate how we are to live a life of obedience as believers. As we follow him steadfastly, we are called to imitate him. In 1 John 2, you don't need to turn there, but listen to these words from 1 John 2, verse 5. By this, the Apostle John writes, we may know that we are in him, that we are united to Christ. How can we know that we're united to Christ? Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. If you say that you abide in Christ, you ought to imitate Christ. Your life ought to look like Christ. And here he says, if you say that you abide in Jesus, what does it mean to abide in Christ? It means to know him. It means to have an intimate knowledge of him. You think of a vine that abides in the vine, the vine branch that abides in the vine. It doesn't, it's not simply just touching the vine. It's not simply just near the vine. In fact, if it's on the ground, just near the vine branch or the vine st uh, stem, it's going to wither and die. The vine, to abide in the vine, is connected. It's receiving its life from the vine. It's intimately acquainted. It's receiving its nourishment and nutrients from the vine. And apart from that connection, the branch would fall to the ground and quickly die. So do you say that you abide in Christ? 
Are you one who claims to say, I abide in Jesus Christ? To say that you are connected with Jesus, that you are intimately acquainted with Jesus, that Jesus Christ is in you and you in him, that through him God is now your father. Do you claim to abide in Christ? Very basically, what it means to be abiding in Christ is to mean that you are connected with God. Are you claiming to be connected with God? If we think about basic humanity, humanity is born into a state of disconnection from God. Because of our sin, we are disconnected from God. For someone to say, well, I've always been a Christian from birth. I've just always been saved. God's always been my father. Scripture testifies that you and I are naturally born into a state of enmity with God, of disconnected with God. Isaiah the prophet tells us, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Isaiah the prophet is saying, our sin has caused a separation between God and us. There is a mighty chasm, a grand canyon, separating humanity from God. And the only way for that grand chasm to be reconnected and crossed over is through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ being accounted to you. It's the basic gospel message, isn't it? Man is sinful. God is holy. Because of man's sin, there is a broken relationship. And the only way that can be fixed is through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And scripture tells us, how can you and I come to be reconnected through Jesus Christ? There is only one way. There is only one gate. And that gate into reconnection with God, into salvation, has two doors. What are those two doors? Repentance and faith. We must turn from our sin and look at our sin, change our mind about our sin and say, I don't want my sin. Turn to God and cry out for forgiveness from our sin. That's repentance. And we must put our faith and trust in Christ. That's belief. A total entrustment of everything we are to all that Christ is saying, Jesus, I cannot save myself. I trust you and you alone. So I ask you again, are you one who has repented of your sins? Have you believed, truly entrusting everything you are to Christ? Are you saved? My friend, if you're listening to me this morning and you do not have assurance of your salvation or you know I am not in the kingdom, I do not know this God, then before you look to Jesus Christ as your example to follow, my friend, you must look to Christ as your Savior to worship. As you must look to Christ as your only hope of salvation, as the only one who can reconnect you with God and through repentance and faith turn to Him and be saved from your sin. But if you claim to be a believer, then you know what John has said in 1 John 2, verse 5 and 6? He says, whoever says that he abides in him, in Christ, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Christian, brother and sister, you must, you ought to walk as Jesus Christ walked. That means your life ought to reflect the life of Jesus Christ in the flesh when he was on earth. People ought to be able to look at you and as they looked at Peter and John in Acts chapter 4 and say, these men have been with Jesus. There's something about these people. They're reflecting Christ. Oh, we've seen this behavior before. I've seen someone love like that before. I've seen someone do something so unexpected to actually give to their enemy, to actually pray for those who persecute them. I've seen that before. Guys, where did we see that? That Jesus, we saw that in Jesus, and we see it in them. Those of us who claim to abide in Christ, to walk with Christ, ought to reflect Christ in our life. And very practically today, what I want us to t say is, 
what does, or answer the question of what does this look like? How do we know if our life is a reflection of Jesus Christ? You can turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. We'll look at the first two verses. Very simply and plainly put, the overarching example set for us in Jesus Christ is a life defined and characterized by one word. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Very simply put, what is the overarching example set for us in Jesus Christ? What was his life defined and characterized by? Love. Walk in love. As Christ loved, so you too should love. He gave himself for us. What more, what greater display of love could we have? Remember we talked several weeks ago about how he gave himself for us, the creature, while we were enemies, and yet he did not give himself for the angels. The angels sinned and were damned. No second chances, no savior for them. Second Peter, or Peter tells us in 2 Peter 2, they're being bound in chains and gloomy darkness awaiting the judgment. And yet for you and I, enemies of Christ, not innocent bystanders who've happened to make a few mistakes, but active enemies of Christ by worshiping ourselves instead of honoring and worshiping God. And Jesus Christ died for us while we were enemies. In that is love. What a display of love. He gave his life for us. And so we too are to strive in our lives to imitate Christ in his love by walking in love. But of course, I want to start getting more practical with you and I over this week and next week and say, okay, what does it look like for you and I to actively walk in love day to day as Christ did? So let's break this down. Today, I want to consider just two examples that Christ puts before us. There's an outline in the back of your bulletin if it's helpful for you. We will look today very simply at Christ's example of a devotional life. Secondly, Christ's example of God honoring financial stewardship. So Christ's example of a devotional life and God, Christ's example of God honoring financial stewardship. So first, Christ's example of a devotional life. This is Christ's love vertically displayed. This is the love of Christ that he displayed toward God. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, strength, and soul, and love our neighbor as ourselves. If we get that twisted, and if we begin to strive to seek to love others without properly loving the Lord, the love or the so-called love that we display towards others will in fact be a malnutritioned love, if love at all. We must begin first and foremost with our vertical love. And Christ sets for us a wonderful example of how to cultivate and how to culture, uh, cultivate and deepen the love you have for the Lord and the intimacy with God the Father. Turn with me to Mark chapter 1. We're going to read a bit of a uh, hefty section here from Scripture from Mark chapter 1. I want us to read a good portion of this chapter. We'll pick up in verse 14 after Jesus has come out of being tested for 40 days in the wilderness. He's now starting his public ministry at 30 years old. And we pick up here in Mark 1 with in verse 14, with Jesus Christ's very first sermon. Read with me, Mark 1, 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. 
And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. So we see, we'll pause there for a second, Jesus Christ has just come on the scene in his public ministry, and he's proclaimed the gospel. And as he's walking along, he's calling disciples to himself. And they enter into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he begins to teach. And this is where I want us to pick up. Verse 22, And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Christ is preaching authoritatively with power. And the Jews have never seen anything like it. They look around and say, this man teaches like one who has authority, not like our scribes. And then watch what happens next. Verse 23, immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him and they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because he knew them. They knew him. Jesus' first day of ministry. He's just gathered his disciples. He's walked in on the Sabbath. And as he's begun to preach, the people were astonished. And soon after he's preaching, a man cries out, a demon-possessed man cries out against him, and Jesus, in the moment, casts out the devil from him. Upon leaving the synagogue, his fame goes everywhere. He's the talk of the town. He's the talk of the city. It's spreading everywhere, which means attention is coming to him. And immediately he enters the house of Simon, and Andrew with James and John. And what does he find there? Does he find a nice cooked meal and he can relax and finally say, what a day at the synagogue, casting out a demon, preaching with authority. My fame is going everywhere. People are clamoring for me. He finds a sick woman. And yet again, Jesus Christ the man expends himself to heal Simon's mother. And she gets up and begins to serve. So now he's just poured himself out again. And what? Now he rests. Now he can relax. No. Then all of the city is at his doorstep. Clamoring for him. And he doesn't just say, shut the door. Tell him tomorrow. He heals one after another after another. Demon-possessed people. Demon-possessed people are not like those that he's healing who come to him and say, can you please heal this? Demon-possessed people are like the man in the synagogue saying, what have you to do with us? Have you come before our time? Antagonistic, evil, vile, hating, putrid, against him, fighting him, and he's casting them out left and right. It says, many who were sick he healed. He cast out many demons. What a day of ministry. I really can't imagine a day of such expenditure. You ask a preacher after preaching once on a Sunday, then counseling a few people, maybe preaching twice. And there's a couple difficult situations in the afternoon which are really emotionally stressful. And by five o'clock, ask that preacher how he feels. You want to know how he feels? Drained, wiped out, exhausted, 
expending himself in the pulpit, pouring himself into the preaching of the word, and then afterwards just dealing with a couple of difficult situations, and then counseling a few here, going here, doing a bit of an outreach, going home, and wiped out by five o'clock. That's the reality of our human weakness. We are wiped out, we're drained, we're tired. And Jesus Christ, in his first day here in ministry, was preaching, or first or second, was preaching to multitudes, casting out demons, fame spreading throughout the land. Have you ever had someone who's been very, very needy and is, is take, you spend a few hours and they just want from you and they take and take and take, and after just three hours of, of speaking with them or interacting of ministering to them how do you feel I feel wiped out right i just need to sit back i need to have a you know a, a cold soda and relax after just a few hours of one person just draining from you jesus christ had a city pulling out of him wanting healing wanting to be taught Pour, pouring out giving of himself an exhausting day of labor, of intensive ministry. And the striking thing is this. Look there in verse 35, the very next words. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark. Listen to me, teenage boys. The world still is turning when the sun's not up at 8 o'clock. The world is still going on. There's existence outside while you're asleep. Jesus Christ, in the early morning, while it was still dark, the sun wasn't even peeking over the horizon, it says he departed, went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Now think of Jesus Christ the man. Don't have in your mind... Jesus Christ tapping into his deity and just overcoming supernaturally his human constraints. Jesus Christ was fully man, fully God. We examined it several weeks ago. He was susceptible to the weaknesses of humanity. And this man, after a day of pouring out to hundreds, even thousands perhaps, not just a simple word, but casting devils out, speaking truth, healing, gets up before the sun is even over the horizon, goes out to a desolate place. Not just around the corner, he goes out where his disciples will later have to find him. And what does he do? He prays. He devotes himself to intimate communion with his Father. And we'll see why. Look at verse 36. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him. Notice they had to find him. He wasn't just laying in his sheets outside his bed or around the corner. They had to actually go and search for him. He wanted to be alone, away from everyone, and said to him, everyone is looking for you. Now, a point of, in your devotional life, Christian, when Jesus Christ, when it here says everyone's looking for him, this is serious. This isn't everyone's looking for you like somebody, like your mother's texting you wondering what you want for breakfast or your buddy wants to know what you're going to do that afternoon and so searching and you've just got to respond to the phone and so you've got to interrupt this quiet time alone with the Lord because one person really wants to know if I want the, the bacon or the ham on my taco. This is Everyone's looking for Jesus to be healed, to have demons cast out, to learn the gospel, to know the truth. Everyone, a city, was looking for this one man. And he leaves it and is quiet and alone. Do you see that? I'm not trying to be trivial talking about breakfast. What I'm trying to show you is how quickly can we in our devotional life think, oh, I've got to respond. I've got to get back to this. I've got to give myself to this. Jesus Christ left it so his disciples did not even know where he was as a whole city was searching for him to be healed and to hear the gospel of salvation. And they couldn't find him because he was desolate and alone with the Lord. 
Does your devotional life reflect Christ's? Let's read on. Everyone's looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. Now notice this. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. What was the result of Jesus Christ being desperate and dependent to be alone with the Lord? More ministry. More accomplishment for the kingdom. Leaning upon the Holy Spirit, pleading with his Father in prayer, this is the desperate dependence of the man Christ Jesus upon his Father, and the direct result was more ministry accomplished. Jesus Christ needed this time alone with God if he was going to be of any use at all. And if Jesus Christ, now listen to me, if Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, deity in the flesh, was dependent upon the Holy Spirit in prayer to his Father in order to be any use on earth, what kind of dependence do you think you and I need to have upon the Father in prayer? We're talking about Christ. Sinless, perfect, desperate, dependent to accomplish kingdom advancement. Getting away from everybody and everything to be alone before the sun is even above the horizon. Desperately clinging to the Father where people can't find Him. Does that reflect your life of devotion to the Lord? Mr. Hamilton, who we've talked much about in these recent weeks, one of the most well-respected men in my life personally, sent me an email last year and he wrote these words. Speaking of his ministry first, he said, We press forward in faith in the midst of blessings, opportunities, and challenges. He is faithful and is sustaining us. And we know some of the ministry there. We know some of the obstacles they're up against even this week. And listen to these next words from a seasoned, godly man to a young man my, such as myself. Give your best hours to secret prayer and He will strengthen and guide. Young men, women, fathers, mothers, children, if you say you abide in Christ, your life ought to reflect the life of Christ. And when we take a snapshot of his devotional life, what do we see? The best hours of Christ devoted to secret prayer. I mean secret prayer, alone prayer, away from the distractions, away from the hustle and bustle, running off to find time with the Lord where you can be in intimate communication and fellowship with him. Give your best hours to secret prayer and He will strengthen and guide. Your best hours, your first hours, your most precious hours. Give them, church, give them to private prayer. If you want to be of any eternal good in this short, quickly fading life, give yourself to this. Look at Christ. He was a man of prayer. Before lazy, raising Lazarus from the dead, what did He do? He looked to heaven and he prayed. Right before he was to endure the greatest suffering of any human imaginable, bearing the weight of literally billions and billions and billions of sins on his shoulder and the full justice of God's wrath in three hours of time condensed, right before that, what does he do? He looks to heaven and to his Father he prays. My friends, Jesus Christ lived a life of prayer. He prayed when he was faced with temptation. He prayed before feeding the 5,000. Jesus prayed after feeding the 5,000. Aren't you and I grateful that Jesus prays? In this sense, Jesus Christ prayed for Peter not to fail. Do you remember that? Satan demanded to sift you like wheat, Peter, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail when you rise again, strengthen your brothers. 
you know he's prayed the same prayer for us. Aren't you thankful that Jesus Christ lived a life of prayer? Listen to these words in John 17, 9. This is Christ praying to the Father. I am praying for them. That's you and me. Christian, that's you and me. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them, and I know, am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name. Jesus Christ praying for you and I. You're grateful for that, aren't you? That's what's keeping you in the love of Christ, the prayers of Christ, the intercession of Christ. Well, Christian, if you are to live a life imitating Christ and you look at his devotional life and he's praying desperately dependent intercessory prayers, which you are eternally grateful for, what ought your prayer life to look like? Interceding for others? What about those who followed him? We have the example of Christ. But what about those who followed him? How did they imitate him? Remember the 120 on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell and the gospel started to be proclaimed. I think we talked about it on Wednesday night where this world before Christ, it was in darkness, but the sliver of, of revelation to the Israelite people when the day of Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit fell, you know what happened to this dark world? Lights scattered everywhere. The gospel went forth. We, from 12 men, 12 men, Billions of people have heard and believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ from just 12. And what were those 12 doing right before the Holy Spirit fell? They were hiding in a little room, gathered together. And Luke tells us in Acts chapter 1, they were praying. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ exemplified to us what it means to be a human being dependent upon the Lord. And my question for you is, are you living a life of prayer? Those of us who will be most used of God in His kingdom purposes will be those who spend the most time quietly alone with Him. It is the busybody that does so much and accomplishes so little. It is the one who is alone with the Lord, sitting at Christ's feet daily in prayer, in meditation, in reading the Word, who will accomplish much in this life. As I prepared this and as I was examining the life of Christ and His prayer life, I had to pause many times because of conviction of my own life. Write half a sentence study through half a verse, and enter into prayer myself. Because looking upon Christ, brothers and sisters, do we see Christ in the example? He said, this isn't Christ putting himself on a pedestal and saying, look at me and look what I've done. He's saying, come, look at me and follow what I've done. Come here, come after me. Why do you think Mark wrote, in early in the morning, before the sun was out, he went to a desolate place and there he prayed while everyone was looking for him. Why the details? We see it strewn throughout the Gospels because Christ wants us to follow his example in our devotional life with God. Secondly, let us consider then Christ's example of God honoring financial stewardship. Christ's example of God honoring financial stewardship. First, turn please to Matthew chapter 17. We'll look at a couple of verses here <clears throat> before jumping to Mark 12. But Christ honored the authorities that God had placed over him with his finances. Matthew 17, verse 24, when they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, now the two drachma tax, mind you, was not a Roman tax. The two drachma tax was a Jewish tax. It was a voluntary tax. It was used to serve, it was paid to the temple for the temple to provide services. So the Jews were not required to do it under law, under Jewish law, but it was a voluntary tax. And we'll see the nature of that. They went up to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, yes. 
And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him, Peter, first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said, From others, Jesus said to them, Then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the fish, the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. So Jesus Christ voluntarily, not as, so as not to give offense to anyone, even with this voluntary temple tax, paid the temple tax. You know what's astonishing about this? Jesus Christ is himself the true temple of God. Think of it, Jesus Christ there, the true temple, to what this physical temple pointed to, paying a tax to the shadow of what he himself completely fulfilled. And yet Christ submitted, voluntarily submitted, so as not to give offense to the authority and paid a tax. But turn over to Mark chapter 12. Here we have the intriguing question, which probably gets a little stickier. Should Christians pay taxes to wicked governments? Should Christians pay taxes to the government when they know that those tax dollars will be used directly or however indirectly for evil purposes? Look at Mark chapter 12. Verse 13. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he, Jesus Christ, said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Now you and I are undoubtedly thinking about America 2016 and very likely the government funding of abortion. Your tax dollars, to some extent, will go to the funding of abortion. And we can think, it's, a, it's an interesting, it's an intriguing question, isn't it? Do we pay? Do, when the government takes on a role into uh, making moral decisions for the people, such as categorizing abortion as woman's health issue or or any other moral issue, and they begin to fund that with government funding, and they turn around to you, Christian, and say, give me money, and they're funding something which goes against your beliefs as a Christian, a follower of Christ, what do you do? They say, give me this, and they put it into that. We're thinking of America 2016, but think of Jesus Christ. Who was Caesar? The emperor. Who who was employed by Caesar? Do you know a one Pontius Pilate? Mm -hmm. Who employed the Roman army? The Roman centurions? Caesar. Do you realize Jesus Christ is commanding his disciples, pay Caesar, the very one who will employ a man and an army to put me to death? The very funding that the Roman army needed to have the sword that they stuck in his side, the nails that they stuck through his hands, the cross that they hung him on, the the wreath that they stuck in his skull, the very funding that accomplished his death, Jesus Christ commands believers, give it to him. Pay your taxes. It's Caesar's. Church, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was a far greater, much more heinous crime than the Holocaust of the unborn that is taking place in our nation today. And Jesus Christ told his disciples to pay the taxes that made such evil possible. Paul further reiterates this teaching in Romans 13, doesn't he? Pay 
to all what is owed them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. We are, as Christians, to pay our taxes financially honoring our authorities. So how do we reconcile this? How do we then pay our, con- our, our taxes with a clean conscience? Well, we're told if we were to go to Romans 13, we won't go there today, if we were to read on, the government is commanded by God to be ministers of good. The government is commanded to reward good and to punish evil. But here we have a scenario, both in Jesus' time with Caesar, with our time today in America, of a government that is in direct disobedience to that divine mandate. What are we as Christians to do? Very simply, we are not to discard our duty of honoring and reverencing authority due to their sin. Does that make sense? We must ultimately live our lives with the four vital words at the forefront of our mind, as to the Lord. We are to live our lives in obedience. It is ours to obey. We leave the rest to God. Does that make sense? Think, one man put it very wisely. He said this. He puts it into the realm of marriage. Suppose the more a husband loves his wife, the less she respects him. Or the more the wife respects her husband, the less he loves her. In either instance, we are not to try to guess the result of our behavior. We are supposed to do what God commands. We are not responsible for the results of what we do. We are responsible to obey whatever, whatsoever God commands. We are called not to success but to obedience. Do you see what he's saying? But if I respect them, he's he's not going to love me. But if I love her, she's not going to respect me. Therefore, I'm not going to respect. Jesus Christ calls us to obedience. And here Christ, with our finances, saying, honor the governing authorities. The authorities that God has placed over you, honor them. And Jesus Christ demonstrates this with his example through his use of money, what it means to live a life as to the Lord. Isn't that spectacular? Jesus didn't say, you know what? Peter, hold on. This guy, they're going to kill me. These these centurions are going to kill me. Tell, get all the Christians to stop funding them. Let's let there be a financial meltdown in the Roman Empire. We don't want, this is bad. We've got to, he doesn't say that. He says, give it to them. It's due them. And then what does he do? He trusts the Lord. He's given himself completely to God. Father, not my will, yours be done. A total entrustment to God. Christian, you and I, with our finances, are called to that same entrustment. We'll see it to a greater degree in just a minute. So yes, the government is called to account to God. And yes, we are to make our voices known. Now mind you, in the government, pay your taxes and then come and support the pregnancy center. Preach against the abortion. Be a light in this world against the evils of the government, but do so obediently. Honoring Christ's example in his submission to the governing authorities. So that's the first thing. Jesus Christ sets for us an example in honoring with his finances the governing authorities. But secondly, Christ used his resources to serve those with less. In Acts 20, 35, don't turn there, I'll have you turn to another passage in a second. But in Acts 20, 35, the Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus Christ himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. The first question I had when I was reading that, how did Jesus give to the poor? I don't remember a time when Jesus Christ went under the bridge and gave $1,000 to the homeless man. How did Jesus Christ give to the poor. Now do please turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And we will listen to these words from the Apostle Paul. He takes our minds to the Macedonians. Here in these words in 2 Corinthians 8, we'll read the first eight verses. Here Paul, speaking of the Corinthian church, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, there Abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part, for they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, 
begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to pr prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. What has Paul just said? Corinthians, look at the Macedonians. They are bursting with, in, they're, they're, they're bursting at the seams with joy, even though they are suffering extreme, severe, deep poverty. And guess what? Paul tells the Corinthians. This has resulted in an overflow of wealth and generosity. They have given beyond their means. What does that mean, beyond their means? If you give within your means, that means it makes sense, right? I have this many dollars. I have these, this many expenses. I have this left over. I can afford to give that to them. You've given within your means. But Paul says in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Yes, they gave according to their means, and as I can testify, they gave beyond their means. And notice verse 4, begging us earnestly for the favor in taking part in the relief of the saints. Oh, the Macedonians, what an example they are to us. In their poverty, they didn't just say, I got a raise. Hey, church, what do we need to give? They said, I just got fired. Church, what can I give? And they begged Paul, how can we want to take apart? We're eager, we're overflowing. Here, take everything. But you don't even have, okay, I'll take it. They're giving beyond their means, looking to, to overflow in a wealth of generosity giving above and beyond to help the poor, even if they themselves are poor. Isn't that phenomenal? Giving to help the poor, even though they themselves are the poor. You know, as I was praying about this, I was thinking, Lord, I have never suffered want in a day. I have never been able to describe my life as a severe test of affliction. I know some of you have. And here are the Macedonians suffering in poverty. And they give and give and give. The result was more and more and more being poured out. The poor helping the poor. But why? The question we need to ask is why? What's the trigger here? What is the, what's the motivating factor for the Macedonians? What's fueling this supposed craziness, as you're looking in from the outside, you're going, this doesn't make sense. You should be saving. You should be keeping some of that. You have less. What are you doing? Why are you giving to them? Yes, they're poor, but so are you. Don't you see it, you foolish Macedonians? What's triggering this? What's causing this to happen? Look there at verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Jesus Christ was rich. Jesus Christ, in, on his throne in heaven, possessed all riches of eternal treasures, spiritual and earthly. The cattle on a thousand hills, it's his. The gold in the mines, it's his. The diamonds in the hills, it's his. The king's palace, it's his. Solomon only had what he had because from God's hand he gave it to him. Jesus Christ, rich. Over abundantly rich. And he left it. And became poor. So that you and I could be rich. And we're not just talking spiritually, are we? Physically, the Son of Man had no place to lay his head. He was physically poor. He gave it up. 
What fueled the Macedonians? The example of Jesus. Jesus Christ, the one by whom, for whom, through whom all things have been created, emptied himself of it all. He came to this earth, had no place to rest his head, entered into poverty. You realize he entered into poverty the second he descended into Mary's womb? The second he was conceived, he was poor. He did not take advantage of all his rights to the riches of the universe, but voluntarily, on his own accord, submitted himself to utter poverty in this world. Christ, descending from the bosom of the Father, dwelling in heavenly bliss to the dregs of this broken world's lowest society, hanging with the prostitutes, the sinners, and the drunks. Jesus Christ became poor in order that you might become rich. Is there any question then in our mind when we hear the Apostle John pen these words in 1 John 3, 17, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? John's saying, I don't get it. So Jesus Christ became poor for you, and you have earthly riches and refuse to give them up so that another might have his needs. I don't, I don't see how this can dwell in you. Do you see that? What Christ has done for you it produced in the Macedonians overflowing generosity. Even though the world looked on and said, guys, your, your 401k just went out with Brexit. It's just gone. You have nothing less. What are, you, what are you doing? And they're giving. They're giving. They're giving. Brethren, we are called to imitate the example of Christ not only in giving the governing authorities what they, who, that God has placed over us, what they are due, but we are called to follow the example of Christ. Now note this, to sacrificially give to those in need. Sacrificially. Think of it. Unless Jesus Christ had not given up the riches of his eternal heavenly bliss, you and I would be dead in our trespasses and sins plummeting towards hell. If Christ had not sacrificially given of his riches, you and I would be poor eternally poor. You know, when the world says, when you have less, keep more, Jesus Christ shows us, when you have less, give more. When the world says, get as much money as you can so that you can live the most comfortable, easy lifestyle possible, Jesus Christ, by his example, shows us, use your financial resources as a means of supporting, aiding, and encouraging those with less. When the world says that the goal of money is comfort, peace, and security, Jesus Christ demonstrates to us that the goal of money is the glory of God and the good of others. How do you see your money? How do you view it? You know, money will always be viewed as an opportunity. Always. Every dollar you receive is an opportunity. It will either be an opportunity for you to greater serve yourself, or it will be an opportunity for you to bring greater glory to God and service of others in the advancement of the kingdom. Ask yourself, what kind of opportunity is it for you? Jesus gave of his resources that you and I might live. In fact, he gave all of it that you and I might live. We think, well, I've given my 10%. Christ gave 100%. What did he hold back on the cross? Someone name one thing. What did Christ hold back on the cross? Nothing. Complete abandonment from him and the Father. Complete giving of his body in this life. Complete turning away. He gave it all for you and me. Christian, we must think how we can better follow the example of Jesus Christ in the use of our money. Now, I do want to say as a commendation to this body of believers, I have been so 
blessed to see the generosity that has overflowed in this body of Christians. It's been poured out in this church, but my desire is that we would not grow content, that we would not grow and say, I've done enough with past successes, but let us strive with our eyes fixed upon Christ to grow in Christ's likeness in the use of our finances honoring the authorities God has placed above us and striving to use our means as an opportunity to store up treasure in heaven. You know, Christ, who possessed the riches of the universe, had not only every opportunity, but every right to keep his riches to himself, to enjoy perfect fellowship with God. Not just every opportunity, but every right. You and I, our money is is not our own. We don't even have the right to keep it for ourselves. Christ did. And he gave it up. You and I, it's not even ours. And he's calling us to follow in that example. On brothers and sisters, what joy this produced in the churches of Macedonia. Bursting at the seams with joy. They're about to come apart. And then they didn't give and go, oh, what did we do? Their joy is being expounded in their generosity. Well, may we follow Christ in his example. In both our devotional life to Christ, his desperate dependence upon the Lord, and in the use of the finances that we have been loaned in this short life. Next week, I want us to consider the example of Christ in how to relate to others, both believers and non-believers, alike, but let us learn from our Savior what it means to walk in love, in our love to God through our devotional life, and our love for God and others in the use of our financial resources. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Amen. Father, may we follow In the footsteps of your Son, give us strength to do so, I pray. In Christ's beautiful name, amen.